base of it all without fertility, it doesn't matter. The greatest seed in the world um, it isn't going to perform without the fertility behind it. We got to give it the groceries and it's got to be right. Find the, the worst piece of ground that you think is your biggest piece of junk and uh, that you're farming and you don't sometimes don't know why you're farming it. And we'll go out there and we'll do some soil sampling and I promise you within a couple of years you're going to see that farm turn around it. Ladies and gentlemen, farmers, ranchers, and distinguished guests, thank you for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas, methods, trends, and techniques available to help your farm achieve higher levels of farm profitability. The Farm for Profit podcast is co-hosted by Tanner Winterhoff, the Iowa Bankerman, and David Whitaker, the Iowa Land Guy, where in tandem they will share their ideas and advice from industry experts. Thank you again for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. And now, here's Tanner and David. And welcome back to another Farm for Profit podcast. This is Tanner Winterhoff. And this is David Whitaker. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't say that enough. Our audience is fantastic. This network that's been built up is awesome. If you're not taking advantage of this network that you are a part of by listening to this, start start doing it. Find us on Twitter, find us on Facebook, send us an email, farmforprofitllc at gmail.com, and make sure you send us what you think. You know, let us give us a little bit of an idea of what you want to hear, what you think about what we are doing. And uh, Dave, why don't you share a review? I tell you what, we uh, uh, thanks for all the reviews, everybody. Uh, keep sending them in. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. So here's a review, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you for this one. Is it is it Lemon? Is that, Le- Lehman. I Lehman. Think. Is that yep. right, Chris Lehman? Thank you for this uh, at Leems McGeems. Here we go. Uh, just wanted to shoot you guys a message and let me thank you for the podcast wrap. Uh, I really enjoy it because it's so relatable. Um, that's how when we started this, guys. That's what we want to do is coffee shop talk. That's what it was about, and uh, that's. That's what we're here. So uh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that review. Uh, Tanner, they're, they're coming in and I know uh, more listeners every day. Share, like, rate, review this yep. uh, with your friends. Uh, let's build this out there. We just want you to tag along with our conversation and uh, and our party on the uh, Farm for Fun side, if you will. Yeah, that's exactly right. We appreciate it. That fuels our fire a little bit to keep putting a lot of effort into this. We thank you for being a part of this, but we are going to jump right into our What's Working in Ag segment. And I'm going to prepare you our guest speaker has a little bit of an accent. This is going to be a fun one, Dave. It is. It is. So uh, David Head is on with us today, uh, an Australian-born entrepreneur who is has a passion for helping farmers uh, increase their efficiency, kind of like uh, what we started the podcast for, yep. for profitability and uh, the profit for their our operations. So welcome, David. G'day, guys. How are you? Very good. Fantastic. I, we might have to have you on for the whole episode just so we can listen to that accent. <laughs> It works wonders with the ladies. So, so why, why don't you give us a little bit more of your background and uh, uh, cue us in a little bit about yourself. So I grew up um, on a, a dry land farm in southeast of Australia. We farmed uh, between six and 8,000 acres of, uh, of wheat, barley, um, canola, lentils. And uh, we have used for a long time a, a product called a mother bin and... When I moved to the U.S. Um, in 2012, um, I've lived here ever since. Um, prior to that, I had came and worked on the wheat harvest in 2000 and then again in 2003. Um, I fell in love with a town in South Dakota, made a bunch of friends here and kept coming back. And then eventually I invested heavily and built a strip mall here and out of that came uh the mother bin business awesome so when you say dry land farm help our listeners understand what is a dry land farm dry land farm is we do not have any irrigation um it basically non-irrigated farm okay and so then you you uh, came over here to help with the harvest you fell in love with the town in south dakota what uh uh what enamored you about the U.S. that you left? Uh, <laughs> that you left uh, Australia. Initially, it was opportunity. Um, I love farming at home, and I I love being there. We went through a run of pretty horrible droughts, actually, and then it uh, led me. I became a diesel mechanic, and then it led me over here. And I just saw an opportunity over here, and I had it felt like home. To be honest, it really did. 
And now you own a strip mall in South Dakota. <laughs> and oh, <I> do. <laughs> and and impacting ag- impacting agriculture here yes. in the US. So one of the favorite TikTok accounts that I like following is yours. Just seeing these massive mother bins being transported, being put to use. Can you describe a little bit better what that is? Yeah, so a mother bin is basically portable infield storage um, <laughs> or a surge tank. And what it allows you to do is uh, keep the combine moving um, and it reduces the amount of uh, traffic or delays that happen when it comes to the trucking or the combine stopping. So that was that's something that I think we could use on our farm because before we started recording today, we were out picking corn and there was three times to where I was full in the grain cart, combine was full, and the semi sitting on the end rows was full waiting for another truck to come back empty. So this, what I think I read, it's 4,000 bushel. Is that the capacity? Yeah, it's a, it has a capacity of 4,000 bushel. And um, I challenge people to do exactly what you did when everything is sitting there full. And you don't think about it if you're sitting there for five or ten minutes. But if you do that for five or six times a day in a combine, that's an hour a day that you've lost. And that means every seventh day you've got seven hours of combining that you've lost. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point. I mean, I had time enough to eat my lunch waiting the yeah. first time. So that that's really kind of – so how does that work? So is that – you have to have a tractor, though, hooked up to it. It's PTO-driven to unload, correct? That's correct. It's PTO-driven to unload. You really only need a 150-horse tractor to drive the PTO. But <laughs> because it's such a, a big beast, we recommend 250-horse tractor to tow it around. Um, it's 48 feet, lo- uh, sorry, 58 feet long and almost 14 feet wide. And, um, what we did was we took an adaptation in 2015. We built a prototype, um, ran that in 2016. And then we realized there was some fundamental things we needed to change for, uh, the North American market. Um, one of them was we created the ability to blend grain with it because it's so long and wide. You can actually have the front and rear flow gates uh, split. And so if you have some wetter corn that you want to blend off with drier corn, you can uh, can do that. And also we created a steering system that um, has an unbelievable ability of maneuverability to get into tight approaches. Well, that was that was going to be my thought, David, is uh, pulling a 50 foot triple axle (laughs) semi trailer out of a field sometime is a little bit difficult, let alone you said 58 foot long. And ready to go. So last question I got for I let Dave ask some more is when you're unloading. So the guy sitting in the tractor that's hooked up to this, is he in charge of telling a truck driver to move forward or, or how do you load a truck when you're unloading? So the bin actually stays on the wheels. So um, we have two, two ways to do it. Effectively, if the bin's not fully loaded, because when it's fully loaded with 4,000 bushel in it, you can push almost... 275,000 pound fully loaded. Um, so you can't move it forward with the tractor right. while you look. But we do have a remote shutoff system that allows the truck driver to load himself. So you can start the PTO, he can load the first hopper, hit the button and it shuts the grain flow off and then move the truck, hit the button and the grain flow resumes huh. and so on and so forth. So you don't actually need someone sitting in it all the time. And uh, what that allows you to do is reduce the amount of trucks, reduce the amount of labor that you need. A, a very simple way to look at it is you're, if you're not keeping up, it will help you keep up. If you are keeping up, it allows you to reduce the amount of trucks and labor that you need. Let, let's say it starts uh, getting wet outside, something like that. Can I leave it not portable? Can it, can it stay on the farm for a certain amount of time? Yeah, absolutely. As more permanent so, storage or semi-permanent storage? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a customer that uses it for his seed wheat over the over the winter um, in Missouri or Missouri, de- depends. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it has a roll tarp and, it, and it's weatherproof, so it's it's perfectly fine. A lot of people question about it being wet or in a wet field. Our our auger is quite a bit longer than a standard grain cart auger, so. A couple things that actually allows some people to load on the road. It's it's not a massive thirty foot long auger, but it does have quite a bit of reach. Sure. And the other thing is because it's so tall, if it does um, get a little damp or, or or sink down a little bit, it's not a big deal. You can just empty it and it'll pull straight out. 
So hmm. cool. Well, that's a big that's a big tool to put on the farm. But the other cool thing about you, Dave, is that's not the only company and product that you have. What what else do you offer? So part of frustration for me when uh, working with the mother bin was was um, hydraulic hoses, and I really tried to find a simple way to identify and identify hydraulic hoses to hook up to your tractor. Um, I know a lot of guys get a lot of steps in when they're going back and forth, uh-huh. trying to <laughs> trying to trying to hook it up. So I actually uh, invented a polyethylene uh, wrap that we call Outback Wrap, and our tagline is "Make hooking up easy," which uh-huh. is a little bit cheeky, but it's a I like bit it. Fun. I like it. <laughs> and um, we took the um, it's almost standard across most tractors. It's the ISO color system for hydraulics, which is green is always one, blue is two, brown is three, black is four. And a lot of people don't even realize that their levers are are colored like that. And we uh, mark the poly um, polyethylene wraps. We laser them. And then we also cut them different lengths. So the A wrap, so 1A, or 1 is always green, but 1A is two coils longer than the B wrap. And therefore, if you just hold up the green ones instantly, you know which ones are A and B. Yeah. The reason we did the reason we did A and B is because um, sometimes your remotes are side by side, and sometimes they're above and below each other. So A mm-hmm. and B kind of covers both of those. That that's fantastic. I when I had talked to my dad about having you on today, uh, we were getting ready to hook up the Ripper, and he had just complained that it took him four tries <laughs> to get the hoses hooked up the way he wanted to. So super excited to get some of those wrapped around there. So we don't have to don't have to do that again, Dave. Do you see that being practical? I definitely. I, I you know what I've done in the past is I've used electrical tape, and and the one that I want on A is maybe has a one single nub of electrical tape, and <laughs> and the B is two or zip ties. I've used that before. Um, ear tags. I've seen cattle guys do right, that. Uh, right. uh, you know, there's some ways. So this is a pretty good solution. I I got to give you a plug here. What, what where where do we find these? What's the website? So you can go to www.outbackwrap.com, and uh, if you keep an eye on us, I know we've got a Black Friday thing coming up if you want to give it a go for the first time, but usually what we find is people buy one or two packs, and then they come back and do their whole farm. We Yeah, we're really excited about this, Dave, and I appreciate the partnership with Farm for Profit. So even if they don't make it out there on Black Friday, if they use Farm for Profit, remember guys, Farm, the number four profit, you type that in as one of the coupon codes, you get 20% off. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I as, as uh, David Best said it, give it a go. Make hooking up easy. <laughs> 20% off. <laughs> get, get there and get some of these. You guys are going to want them. Uh, if you are uh, a friend of a farmer and you're listening, um, stocking stuffers, these will fit in a stocking. Yeah. That Christmas is coming. We're, we're, we're less than 60 days away, man. Yep. Christmas is coming. Buy two or three packs of these, throw them in there, and then... Uh, they'll, I, probably, they'll probably love you to death. It'll be one of those to where they open it up and they probably wonder what the heck it is but as soon as you explain it to them yeah i can see this going a long ways we're not far from black friday so nope. it's it's coming so, so dave, dave before we wrap up is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience yeah sure so um uh, we get we do get a lot of comments about the about zip ties and things like that so the polyethylene unlike zip ties won't go brittle or break in a uh in the cold weather or um ear tags fall off or get caught on things we actually have make them quite robust, so they almost double as a bit of a handle when you when you use them as well. So, um, like I said, we usually put one on and definitely use that farm for profit uh, for code for twenty percent off your whole order. And stocking stuffers is a great one for anyone looking for something for a farmer friend. So, Dave, uh, you, you do two products there: uh, Outback Wraps and Mother Bins. What's the website for the Mother Bins? Uh, the website for the mother bin is www.motherbin.com and uh, you can either talk to myself or Crystal about it and check it out. Well, very good. I got one more question. Do it. Is it is it good day or is it good on you? Well, good day is hello and then good on you means can either mean sarcastically like uh, what are you doing or <laughs> you've actually achieved something. So it can, good on you can actually be two different things. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. Well, th- thanks again for joining us, Dave. We really appreciate that. And remember to go out there, outbackwraps.com, use Farm for Profit to get yourself a little bit of a discount. 
I say we roll right into our next topic. You bet. That sounds very good. Our main topic today is using uh, precision agronomy, uh, maybe even um, variable rate technology is what we're going to do. Yep. And that was what's working in ag, Dave. That was pretty cool. So make sure that you remember uh, reaching out Outback Wraps or Walkabout Mother Bins and uh, use that farm for profit code to get you 20% off. Now the main topic is we're going to try and take an angle at precision agronomy and positively affecting your bottom line, taking those soil samples, using variable rate technology, and using the technology that Granular has to offer. And so, Tanner, today we have uh, Josh Kaiser on the phone with us uh, from uh, Granular Agronomy CSA in South Dakota. Josh, welcome. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. You bet. Josh, tell us just a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, and how are you involved with agriculture? Yeah, so I live in Emory, South Dakota, which is in the southeastern part of the state. Um, Grew up on a family farm out here. Um, Now I'm the fifth generation farming um, on some of this land here in southeast South Dakota. Uh, farm with my dad and two brothers. We grow primarily corn and soybeans. Um, work as a CSA for granular. Um, then we also, my brother owns a pioneer dealership. So been in ag uh, since we got out of college. Uh, started in the co-op system and uh, worked as an agronomist through that for a while. And then uh, was into a pioneer sales rep for a while. And then have transitioned now into the CSA role with granular. So what, what is a CSA? What does CSA stand for? Uh, certified Service Agent. I can't even remember right now. <laughs> certified Service Agent. Sounds good to me. CSA, yep. Certified <laughs> Service Agent. I like that. So how, how did you get into that role with Granular? What did you do leading up to that, or, or what led you that direction? Yeah, like say, uh, through our, our Pioneer relationships and, and having a uh, – uh, my brother owned a Pioneer dealership and the other brother working for Pioneer um, as a district sales manager uh, when in Circa first came out before it became agronomy or uh, excuse me, granular um, kind of got us into the role of doing the CSA was looking for something uh, independent on our own to be able to still farm and then, you know, really tie in the things we were trying to do on our farm to be able to offer those services to other people. So the, the soil sampling and, and variable rate technology and that type of stuff is how we kind of got rolled into this uh, relationship with Granular. Well, that's great, Josh. Uh, we're going to get deeper into the uh, VRT and variable rate technology and soil sampling here in a little bit. Uh, one of the things that uh, we always try to do on Farm for Profit uh, podcast is is how do we become more profitable? So we're going to relate that into uh, variable rate technology. Technology. You said you're a fifth generation on your farm. I'm guessing that your your father's father probably didn't do variable rate, and uh, you probably brought some of that new tech to the table. Correct? That that would be correct. You know, even even my father, um, up until we came back and started farming, uh, wasn't really you know adopting any of the new technologies. Happy with where he was and where yields were, and and uh, was getting you know towards the twilight of his career. So. Um, not really looking to advance himself and learn new technologies, but as we came back in, you know, uh, brought some new ideas and, and helped uh, improve the bottom line here because at the end of the day, uh, we're farming for a profit and, and uh, those things all matter. So perfect. Well, I, that was my next question is do you see the use of these uh, across the board? Let's let's generalize farming for a minute here. Uh, across the board, do you see the, the use of uh, developing variable rate technology as a method for our farmers, our listeners to be more profitable? I do. Um, having come, you know, my, my formal education being in business and finance, um, you know, looking at the bottom line is, is where I usually tend to look at on the farm. You know, obviously we love producing big yields and, and producing as many bushels as possible and trying to market them properly. But I like to look at this side of it as, you know, kind of cost control and, and what are we getting for return on investment. So our use of variable rate technology is only helping us become more efficient with our inputs, whether that be seed or fertilizer or chemical, uh, where we're, we're adding to our bottom line through these, these uh, technologies. So that kind of my baseline understanding of VRT is you're, you're, you're better able to optimize that investment that you put out there. You, you get to control where you're putting down the nitrogen, where you're putting down everything that you want from seed to whatever input is going out there to where you're not over applying in a spot where there isn't yield potential and making sure the best parts of your field get more, uh, get more of the juice to, to get out of this. Is that kind of right? 
That's absolutely correct. You know, if you look across, you know, certain farms and depending on where you are, you know, there's variable variability within soil type and and uh yield potential on those different soils every farm's got some different spots to them and you've got everybody's got those spots that just you know you've thrown everything at them and they just don't seem to yield like you know the other spot across the field and and the thought process there is being why do i continue to give this area that just never produces as much as these other areas that much fertilizer or that much seed and at night, I don't get the return on it. When I could take that same fertilizer I've been giving that, cut the rate down, and potentially put that on the better parts of the field and try to um, enhance the yield over there, you know, at the end of the day, we might be still using the same amount of fertilizer or seed across the entire farm, but we're putting it where it's most utilized and we're just cutting back inputs on those areas that just won't yield because there's just those spots and those soil types and no matter what you do to them they're just not going to keep up with some of those other ones so josh you got me wondering here you know when i think variable rate i think of uh, individual row planter shut off and individual row spraying uh you know and putting more on some and less on others there's got to be a huge startup to this how, how does the guy even get started you know, the easiest way is, is to find yourself, um, you know, some GPS guidance equipment would be the first thing. And no matter what type of brand or flavor you want to put on or what color you drive for a tractor, there's affordable options out there to start getting into the GPS tracking because that's going to be the biggest thing is we can go out and we can do soil sample and you can hire somebody to help you do that. But if you're actually going to get into the variable rate on yourself, you're going to have to have a geo reference with GPS and be able to, you know, control that stuff. Um, there's older equipment out there capable of doing all of it, and you can add on and piecemeal what you want. You just got to find yourself a partner willing to look for some of that stuff, and whether it's hopping on, you know, an online auction and finding some of these used things. Like, I can get into some of these fairly reasonable, where you can take an older planter and you can convert it over to a variable rate seating, potentially, Um you know, there, there's a lot of options for it. You just got to find yourself a partner that understands, number one, what you need to add to it. But uh, I that would be my first thought is find yourself a partner that understands, you know, what you're trying to accomplish, what your equipment is, and, and try to help you get there in a, uh, you know, reasonable manner instead of going out and buying brand new. Because not everybody's going to be able to go out and buy the latest and greatest. And you don't have to. There's plenty yeah. of good old technology out there available. So is that what a CSA with Granular can help with? Can they help put this plan together and get somebody started? Absolutely. So, you know, uh, as my role as a CSA, that's one of the things we do is we sit down with guys and try to help us, them accomplish their goals and become that advisor. So we can sit down and, you know, I may not be an equipment expert, but I know some people that are pretty good with equipment. I kind of have a baseline understanding of the things they need based on different types of, of, you know, planting equipment or tractors and that such and sprayers that we can get you pointed in the right direction and kind of let you know, you know, here's the options you can do to start adding this stuff. And then where I come in as a CSA is, you know, on the advisor side of it, but then I also offer soil sampling services where we can go out and grid sample or zone sample fields, depending on how we want to set things up, uh, come back with recommendations based off of, you know, yield goals and where our fertility levels are to create variable rate seeding maps. Uh, we can do variable rate fertilizer. Um, we can help out with irrigation, um, just a, a bevy of, of products and, and uh, things that we can do to help out. So that you just mentioned, you said a phrase, soil sampling. And I've got clients as a banker that sometimes don't know if that's worth the time and the cost. I mean, what, why do we soil sample and what's the best way to go about getting those samples? Yeah, so soil sampling at least gives us an idea of where we're at. And it gives us an idea of whether we have something that we maybe need to build upon as far as the soil fertility levels or if we've got adequate levels there where maybe we can just maintain them and still uh, get the yield that we're looking for off those acres. Uh, it, it's just one of those things that gives us a little more knowledge about what we're dealing with. Because at the base of it all, without fertility, it doesn't matter. The greatest seed in the world um, it isn't going to perform without the fertility behind it. we got to give it the groceries, and it's got to be right. So we look at, in our end of it, um, we do a lot of of grid sampling and typically we do two and a half acre grids uh, you can go smaller than that or you can go uh, larger than that you know up to five acre grids but we like the two and a half it kind of fits in there where um, you know we're catching the variability between soil types 
and we're getting a baseline level knowing exactly what's out there and then we can come up with a plan on how we want to fertilize those acres and we can build ourselves some zones or uh, environmental response units we call them within granular um, that we can also overlay you know multi-years worth of yield data and, and set up some some uh, decision zones that we can decide how we want to attack them for our seeding or fertilizing um, so josh if i'm a first timer at this uh and, and and you said the word plan i really like the word plan uh plan to succeed and not plan to fail um i'm guessing you at granular will help us make a plan and uh and move forward with rates uh when we're going to do it how we're going to do it what equipment we need for me to do that as a new guy, when I come and meet with you, what do I need to bring to the table? What questions do I need to know? Yeah, or, first, or, you know, yeah, first meeting. What's it look first, like? First meeting. What's that look like? Am I supposed to bring like my entire farm data plan or what am I supposed to bring? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you come in with an open mind and you come in with a set of goals or you come in with a, a, a piece of ground that you're just disappointed in is where I like to start. Um, you know, just trying to build a relationship and, and build a, a uh, baseline set of knowledge off of us come in and let's attack this thing and say, okay, why are you looking at adding variable rate technology? You know, whether it's fertilizer or, or seeding, you know, what's your end goal with that? Um, I like to have guys, you know, if, if they're not completely sold on it or just want to dip their toe in it, you know, come to come to the table with a piece of dirt or a farm that they just, they've been struggling with and they just don't understand what's going on out there. Um, and those are generally the ones that, you know, we can find the most variability in, and that's where we can go in and we can put to a plan together and say, okay, we've got this piece, you know, here, we always take the farmer's history of it, and, you know, he can tell me, yeah, this spot here doesn't look right or whatever. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go out and probably grid sample it in most cases on two and a half acre grids, and we're going to go in there and each point set of two and a half acre grids, we're going to go pull six inch soil samples and uh, we'll have a sample for that. Once that comes back, we'll get that thing all analyzed in our system, and we can put together some maps where we can come back and look at it and say, okay, these parts of the fields are severely low in PK, whatever we need. These spots are pretty good. And we can look at how we want to build them or maintain them and put some numbers to it. And then we either work with the farmer themselves to help get them set up with the prescriptions to go out and spread that if they're doing it on their own. Otherwise, we can work with any of the retailers. Um, you know, through our software with Granular, we can write a prescription that goes into any color machine that, that's out there capable of doing variable rate spreading. And that's the first part we usually look at. Um, you know, if a guy wants to get into the whole farm analysis, we can bring in multiple years of yield data and overlay those things over the top, um, combine that with elevations through LIDAR, and then, you know, obviously follow back up with the soil samples and you can kind of, you can build those areas. But it always comes down to trying to find out what the goal is for that, that producer. Holy smokes. I, I now know why your job exists. That sounds like an absolute ton to, to manage. So I'm just thinking about how far the technology has advanced in these last couple of years. And, and one of the little phrases that you said was creating decision zones that you can then take a look at and, and make your decisions off of. So it's not necessarily purely by soil type and it's not necessarily by, you know, northwest corner, southeast corner. You're really trying to find something that, that is like enough and put that together and help forecast what that field's going to look like. But but one thing that, that I'm concerned about, and I, I don't know if it's a concern is the right word, but what what about granular and your role makes you the right partner to, to go about, you know, taking a look at this and giving good advice on? Yeah, yeah I think when you combine uh, – granular's knowledge uh and software platform along with the people on the ground we are the right company to work with and the fact that it's been tested um we've got partnerships with ibm weather so we can overlay 20 years worth of weather modeling um, to understand exactly how you know nitrogen and weather are going to interact with each other um is that all part of the granular business It'd be part of a grand, yes, through the granular agronomy, you would have access to all the weather data on every individual farm. Um, they can do forecasting on it. Um, that's part, main part of our nitrogen model. Um, when we predict how much nitrogen we may need to add, you know, uh, in season to hit our yield goals, it's going to be based off of 
soil types, what the soil actually has in it through soil testing, and then with weather data. And then obviously you have the access to the weather modeling that'll tell you exactly, you know, forecasted amount of, of how much rain you should have had on each farm without having to have a actual rain gauge or a weather station at every individual farm. Well, there you go. So for our listeners that uh, if, if you're still not picking up on what we're putting down here, but variable rate technology, we're using specific data to try to make us more profitable in certain parts of our field uh, using some granular software is what Josh does as a CSA. Josh, do you give me an example. Show me an example or tell me one of, of somebody you've helped down the road and maybe even if you can comment on it, how much they saved or or what it did for them. Yep, and I'll, I'll even just tell you our, our own experience on our farm. So when we when uh, Encirca first came out, which was the precursor to granular, if you will, uh, my brother was working with Pioneer, and they came out with a pilot program to try the nitrogen modeling on our farm. At this point, we had most everything kind of uh, grid sampled and we had been doing variable rate fertilizer and getting our, our base levels corrected and our pH corrected through that. Uh, but they came out with this uh, nitrogen modeling deal and we decided to try it. And we tried it on two quarters the first year. And then the second year, I think we had half our corn acres enrolled. And then now for the last four years, we've been enrolled um, on every acre. And what I can tell you on our own farm, and it's not going to be typical for everywhere, but we're pretty variable in our soils in South Dakota, but since we've started using the uh, nitrogen program through granular, we have decreased our nitrogen usage by on average 30 units per, per farm or per acre across the entire farm. So, you know, you can put that money to it. Um, we were typically in the past blanket spreading for what our yield goal was based on what we thought we needed for nitrogen out there. So if you said you were going after 200 bushel corn, you were probably putting somewhere between 175 and 200 units of nitrogen out there. Um, now we've got that cut down to closer to 140, 150 units trying to shoot for, for 200. So we're, we're saving ourselves money um, on the nitrogen side of things uh, and in real money. And we're still maintaining or actually increasing our, our yield goals. Interesting. So, you, so Tanner, my, my favorite saying that I say all the time is the juice, juice worth, worth the, the squeeze. squeeze. I knew you were going. <laughs> and, and that's where I'm going. So they figured out on their farm uh, where the to squeeze to. That's how far they went. And they made it so that they uh, juice their crops just enough, but not too much so they're not losing money. So you can also optimize input uh, with variable rate planting. Do you ever use different hybrids on different fields because of different reasons? Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, out here and in our part of the world, uh, like I said, we get pretty variable. You can be in a, a quarter of ground where you've got some gumbo bottoms up to the top that are completely clay or gravel knobs. And, and you know, the bottom ground, you're going to push your populations on and you're going to obviously try to cut them up on top so you can try to maintain at least some sort of plant structure because um, just blanket planting 30 or 32,000 population doesn't work in most situations out here because you'll just end up disappointed. So um, we've got hybrids we know that can flex on those areas where you do have them lighter soils up top. Um, so we work with the Pioneer guys hand in hand. Um, they've got the seed knowledge on which ones can handle some flexible, which ones can handle population. And once we understand where our fertility levels are at and what type of soil we're dealing with, we can take their knowledge of the hybrids and how they interact with those inputs and, and soil types. And we can do variable rate seeding and change hybrids by field or, you know, in some cases, some guys even have multiple hybrid planters out here where in the bottom they'll plant one hybrid and as you go up the top and they're dropping population they'll switch to a different hybrid so the corteva owning granular having purchased granular obviously that gives kind of a an umbrella of other entities and in companies that you have access to you know you mentioned the weather history and the weather forecasting through ibm uh and then pioneer is another one of those too so how can granular agronomy and Pioneer work together for those who maybe already plant Pioneer, maybe are interested in doing it, but is there, is there a unique benefit to those that do? Yeah, there, there are some benefits. Um, obviously if you've got a trusted seed advisor, um, they know your farm too. And those are guys that we bring in when we sit down and have first meetings, uh, far as granular 
and just say, okay, what, what are you guys trying to accomplish? What type of hybrids are you using? What populations? And we can bring them in and then they also get to see what we're trying to do on the fertility side so they can make better recommendations of what hybrids to put out there. So it's a nice give and take. And then, you know, you can wrap in the Corteva side of it with the chemical and uh, understand that, you know, the pioneer guys know which hybrids are probably going to benefit from a fungicide treatment or different herbicide applications. Um, we can wrap the whole thing up together and, and have a, a trusted team, I guess. So it, it's kind of a neat deal to work together. And if one of the parties already has a relationship and you can build off that um, and have that trust, it's, it's a really neat team to put together. So Josh, I, you made me think of two more questions while you were, while you were explaining that one is if we go back to soil sampling how often do I need to do this every year um, uh, under your system or how's that? What, what is your experience there? What's the, what's the frequency that I need to soil sample? Yeah. So, you know, in the past um, the old thought process was you, you always uh, did a composite sample. So basically one sample for every field and everybody would do that kind of every fall to see where they were. Um, when we're going out and we're either doing zone samplings by those environmental response units or we're doing the two and a half acre grids, we're typically doing that like once every four years. Uh, we understand that it's an investment and the soil sampling does cost some money, but you go out and you sample year one, we come back with a recommendation and we typically put a two year spread package together where you go out and you put uh, your non-mobile nutrients anyways, your, your P and K and zinc and some of those. Um, down for two years worth of a cropping rotation, depending on what that is. Uh, you crop those two years and you come back and we hit that with a, a build spread again, correcting those troubled spots. And then after that, then we go back in after the fourth year and uh, get another sample and try to see if we've gained any ground on those troubled areas, trying to correct what we've done. So typically most of our guys that are grid sampling, it's a once every four year investment okay. on those farms to sample. So if I got a guy that um, is thinking about doing this, maybe likes your product, likes what you guys are doing, um, heard our podcast and, and trusted us and, and they're going to give you a shot, but they use other technology too. Um, are, how, how seamless do you work with other technology? And like, it made me think immediately who owns the data. So who owns the grid sampling, who owns this and do they all talk together? I know you said uh, different colors work together. It doesn't matter if it's uh, red or green or, or yellow or, or blue or, you know, anything there, but what about other softwares? If they have other co-ops that do the uh, uh, grid sampling, is there a certain thing that they have to have or ask their local person that they still want to do business with? Yeah, as you know, we're we're happy to work with whoever they have if they've got services provided by someone. Um, you know, most of the time we can put those into a shape file um, from wherever it is, send it over on email, and we can import those into our software and get the data off them. And the data at the end of the day always belongs to the grower. You know, we don't uh, hold on to it. We don't own it. We don't share it with anybody else. That's their data to use as they wish. We'll send that and work with whatever retailer or other service provider they want. And, and through the software, as long as we can get them into some sort of a, a file that works, and most everybody has got a, a generic file that will work uh, to send over, and we can get extrapolate that data out of that. So if I'm interested in, in signing up, how, how do I get charged? Or what, what's the fee? Is it by acre? Is it a subscription? How does the charge work for a relationship like this? Yeah, so we we charge a per acre deal depending on what services you're looking at adding. Um, you know, whether it's uh, variable rate seeding um, recommendations, whether it's variable rate fertilizer, there's a fee for that. And then obviously it's a la carte or there is packaged programs to do that. Um, and all this stuff can be run uh, through, you know, like if you are a pioneer customer or a seed customer of that end of it, one of the entities, um, through uh, the Pioneer uh, Deferred Payment System. You can put it on the financing with that. Um, we're all kind of tied in together there. So however you want to handle that, as uh, far as billing goes or um, use those programs, you can. But it's all it's all a la carte. So you pick and choose what services you want and, and what you're look, going after, and it's per acre charge. And it's only year to year. You're not locked into a contract by any means. Um, but typically, if you're spending money on soil sampling and stuff, you're going to try to at least get a couple years out of it to understand if you've made progress on those acres. That or makes not. sense. So, Josh, uh, I got a question for you. I trust people that give me the good and the bad. And so uh, we, we've talked a lot of good. What, what are experiences you've had, uh, your fifth generation? What, what mistakes are there to avoid? What, uh, as, a, as a new person, going to get into it? 
I think the biggest uh, thing is, is, you know, you, you got to step in somewhere and try it and we're going to stumble from time to time. I, I think where we stumbled early on with a lot of the variable rate stuff was probably trying to add too much all at once and not understanding which ones were actually benefiting us. Um, so, you know, start off and, and pick one and see how it goes for you. And then you can build upon that instead of just doing the kitchen sink approach. And we're not really sure um, which one of those is actually providing us, you know, additional money to the bottom line. That's really good to give us an idea of what, what not to do. So if you're out looking for a new client, who is the ideal person that would benefit the most from this? Is there is there an ideal farmer out there? I you know, as far as an ideal farmer, it's it's anybody that is looking to either improve their bottom line or just learning, um, trying to add new things and, and become more uh, efficient or or more profitable. Um, it really doesn't matter generationally. We see it all the way from the kids just straight out of high school up to the, the 80 year old guys that are still at it that, that want to improve. So one of the questions that we ask at the end of every one of our podcasts is in your opinion, what traits do the most successful farmers have that, you know, so be thinking about that one, but I wanted to give you a little bit of time here. I know we cut you off earlier uh, about why you, this would be the company to partner with. You know, we're not always going to be right and we might not pay out, but we learn something in the process. Um, so, yeah, it, if you're willing to, to stick your neck out and, and you know, invest some time, um, there's some really neat things we can learn together. And, and uh, yeah, the easiest way to get a hold of me is, is probably my cell phone. So and, and that's uh, 605-999-8011. Happy to answer anybody's questions or point you in the right direction anyways. And I know that you can go out to granular.ag and, and search around their website. Dave's even got that pulled up here. We we're watching as we were chatting with you. Same thing, farmforprofit.com. We've got a link right there on the front page and that's how you get 10% off anything that you do with granular. So if you follow that link, uh, we can help get that cost down. If it's something that you're thinking about experimenting with and, and putting together, I was talking with Beth, who's been my contact with Granular throughout this series, and she let me know that you have over 200 CSAs in the country that really work hard to get the boots on the ground out there in the farmer's field and working right along with them. So I thought that was a really cool, a really cool fact there too. But what, one thing that I want to ask you before we close up is what do you have to say to that listener right now that's saying, oh, this is a joke, that, that variable rate technology does not really going to benefit my operation what what do you have to say to someone who completely doesn't believe yep i always i always go back to the disbelievers and say give me your worst piece of ground and i will make a believer out of you You find the the worst piece of ground that you think is your biggest piece of junk and uh, that you're farming and you don't sometimes don't know why you're farming it and we'll go out there and we'll do some soil sampling and I promise you within a couple of years, you're going to see that farm turn around. It's not probably not going to be your best piece of ground because that's your worst piece of ground for a reason. But I guarantee we can probably make you uh, more profitable on that and increase your yield goals. Well, that's good. Tanner, yeah, if, for people that might be listening to the first podcast that in this that maybe is the first time you've ever listened, thank you, first off. <laughs> Secondly, um, we're kind of promoting granular today on here. And if you don't know, if this is the first one you've listened to, they have lots of products. And so granular has granular insights, granular business, granular agronomy. There's an egg studio. And then, of course, there's acre value. Some of the things that they do for you is analyze your profits, succession planning. Um, they work with control inputs and inventory. Uh, Tanner, I know they forecast uh, revenues and profits. It's a whole suite of software from crop field planning to uh, uh, seamless connectivity between your mobile devices, uh, you know, yield measuring, the whole gamut. I mean, we're talking, they've put everything together to do that. And now it's not just software. There's CSAs on the ground to help you with it. Right out there to do that too. And also, if this is your first episode, we do get lucky every once in a while and have the lawn mode while we're recording. So <laughs> if you caught that lawnmower in the background, uh, that's all it was. So Josh, why don't you share with our listeners what, uh, what you think the most successful farmer that you know, or maybe you're thinking of a couple of people in your mind right now, what traits about them do you think has made them successful? And then David and I will get ready to summarize and challenge. Yeah, I think, um, the most successful farmers that I know, um, they're constantly trying to learn and trying to improve. Uh, they're, they're curious by nature. They ask questions. Uh, they, they want to know what's going on. They're very involved. And, 
you know, a lot of the, the very successful guys are flexible, knowing that, uh, you know, things change and we need to adapt with the changing times, whether that's technology or environmental issues or uh, regulatory or, you know, anything else. Uh, those guys that stay flexible and then can adapt and change uh, seem to be the most successful over time. That's great. Well, Josh, I'm going to try and summarize what we talked about. So first off, we talked with Josh Kaiser with Granular Agronomy CSA out of South Dakota. And uh, we're, we're talking today about variable rate technology and soil sampling and what it can do for you and how you can be more profitable uh, in relation to Granular's technology to help with that. So the, we, we asked about the process, that what it takes to get started. You kind of gave us a great uh, uh a great idea there, and that is talk with somebody, get a plan going, uh, get the get the technology that you might need. You talked about going to online auctions. It doesn't have to be millions of dollars and brand new. You can outfit new, old, uh, medium equipment, and then and then we make a plan. And part of that plan was to do uh, soil testing, and so. When we're doing that soil testing, we're going to uh, grid sample per the recommendation of the CSA. It might be uh, so many times a year, how, when, where, what, why, but we need the data. So data is going to be the currency of making your farm more profitable. So once once we get that data, then we're going to go, we're going to meet with our guy, we're going to set up goals, and we are going to uh, move forward. And you said it best, give me your worst farm, and I'll try to make it better. We're going to avoid waste, we're going to optimize your inputs, uh, and, and try to spend less money, actually make the juice worth the squeeze on the acres <laughs> that, is, that is that is theirs. So, um, you know, that's, that, that's basically what we talked about all day in a nutshell. I know there's so much more to it, but the proof's in the pudding. Um, if you give, uh, uh, Josh your worst farm and you come out more profitable, came on. Yeah. Hard to, hard to uh, question that once you see the results. So the challenge that I'm going to put out there to you, listener, is this is probably one of the most valuable episodes that we've put together so far. Here, I thought you were going to say the challenge was to hear what I said over the lawnmower <laughs> in the background, but <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, avoid the lawnmower. Go yeah, ahead, Tanner. Keep just, going. What's the, what's well, the challenge? No, I just think that this is, is w- one of the most valuable episodes for multiple reasons. Not only do we have discounts in the relationships with Outback, Wraps, and Granular, but the fact that this is something that you can do, if you have that low producing farm, I, I'm challenging you to identify your worst performing farm and do something with it. It doesn't have to be a partnership with granular. I think that's a great direction to go and start with. But what I want you to do is is try and make it a goal to make that produce the most or the best or most efficiently next year that it possibly can. So that that is certainly something that I want you to do. So the challenge is, Find that and identify that worst producing asset. Could even be in livestock in, or farm ground. Find it and let's put some time, effort into that and use the technology that's available. And then also go visit these websites and use the farm for profit relationship here to get yourself a little bit of discount, making sure that we move this farther. So Josh, what do you think? Do we miss anything? I think you guys hit it right. Well, good, good. And just like you said, you have to try new technology. Change doesn't happen without change. So uh, great uh, aspect to what uh, profitable farmers use. Tanner, give us an update on conference. I know we uh, uh, delayed slash pause slash kind of are going to put it to another time, correct? Correct. It is postponed and there is no no date on the calendar for the postponement. We're hoping that we can get together. But as of right now, there is no 2020 Farm for Profit Conference. So keep tuning in to us every single Monday. Shoot us ideas and topics. If you have something that you want us to hear or afraid you're going to miss out during conference season, farmforprofitllc at gmail.com. Of course, go to the website. Look for these fantastic relationships with Granular and Outback Wraps. Until next time, hooroo. Hooroo, as they say in Australia. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. Perfect. That's that's a wrap right there. Hooroo means goodbye from Australia from our what's working in a egg with David Head. <laughs> what's your what's your TikTok handle? I gotta go find you on TikTok now. <laughs> so it's it's at Outback Rap okay. and it's and it's at Mother Bin One.